Today we're going to be learning about reflection. So to begin with, we're going to be talking about the reflection of electromagnetic waves, which you probably know as light or radio waves. Of course, the reflection of electromagnetic waves is a well-known phenomenon which we observe every day in mirrors. Before we can talk about reflection properly, we need to know how to draw the waves that are going to reflect. Usually when we're drawing waves, we can use wave fronts in order to represent the motion of waves. So a wave front is a crest of a wave as it spreads outwards. We can see that in a two-dimensional wave, the crest of the wave won't just be a single line, it'll be a big circle. By drawing successive wave fronts, we can represent the wave spreading out from the starting point. So these are usually used in 2D waves, because in one-dimensional waves, the wave fronts would just be dots or close together parallel lines. And in a three-dimensional wave, the wave fronts would in fact be spherical, because three-dimensional wave spreads out in all directions, not just in two directions. In our case though, we can use wave fronts to make a simplified view of what the reflection of light looks like. So of course, in reality, light is a three-dimensional wave, but to make things simpler, to make it easier to look at, we can use a two-dimensional representation of the wave. Although this isn't the only way of representing a wave. Another way that we can represent waves is by using rays. The rays are the blue lines in this picture. So as we can see, rays are perpendicular to wave fronts. We can see that for all of these rays, at any point, they're going to be perpendicular to any wave fronts that they pass through. It will, of course, point in a direction because it is an arrow vector and it will of course point in the direction of the wave's velocity. So in this case, because the wave is spreading outwards, all of the rays are pointing outwards. When a wave comes into contact with the boundary between two media, like the boundary between air and water, then it will reflect from that surface. Some of it might in fact pass through the boundary, but at the moment we are only worried about the reflecting part. So the boundary between two media is sometimes called a surface. We can think of a boundary between two media being, for example, the boundary between a piece of glass and air, or metal and air. In each of these cases, there's a surface that separates one medium from the other. As we can see, we've got odd little perpendicular line here. This is called the normal, and it turns out that it's quite helpful to have this line. In particular, when we're looking at the angle of reflection, so the angle at which this light ray bounces off, this perpendicular line is a very, very useful tool to have. And of course, as we can see from the diagram, we call this the normal. We can say that this line is normal to the surface, or we can simply say that it is a normal to the surface. In either case, it means that we have a straight line perpendicular to the boundary. So when we talk about an incoming wave coming to bounce off a mirror or any surface between two media, then we say that this angle between the incoming ray and the normal is called the angle of incidence. We can also call this ray the incident ray. As I'm sure you can guess, we can have a similar angle for once it's bounced off the mirror or the boundary. When it's been reflected, then the angle between the reflected ray and the normal is called the angle of reflection. So on the left side, we have the angle of incidence, and on the right side, we have the angle of reflection. How do these two angles relate to each other? Well, it turns out that they are always going to be equal to one another. That is, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. This is a very important rule if we're ever trying to figure out how we draw reflections of objects or how we draw the reflections of light rays in physics diagrams. When a wave is reflected from a surface, such as a pool of water, its frequency doesn't change. Can you remember what frequency controls in light waves? It controls the color of the light. So the frequency doesn't change, and this means that the color of the reflection will be the same as the color of the incident ray that created it. And of course, because we're not changing into a different medium, we're still in air, for example, the speed of the wave and the wavelength of the wave don't change either. So that means that if we look at an object in a mirror, it will be the same color as if it wasn't reflected. So what happens exactly when we look into a mirror? How do the light waves behave as we're looking at them? Let's take a look at this diagram. Here we have the light from an object, the incident rays coming in from the left, striking a mirror and being reflected and becoming reflected rays on the right side of the picture. Those are represented by the white lines. So for all the rays of light that are coming in, the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection. We can see that all the lines coming in are parallel, so all the reflected lines are also parallel. This is because for each one, the angle between the surface and the incoming ray is the same as the angle between the surface and the reflected ray. The thing is, our brains don't really work in a way that lets us understand reflections properly. See, the brain has a way of looking at light, which makes sense for almost every circumstance, that says that light always travels in straight lines. 
So it means that if we see white parallel lines coming up toward us, our brain assumes that they must have been traveling in a straight line until they're emitted by whatever source is giving them out. So our brain thinks that these light waves are coming from something behind the mirror. Let's draw a diagram of that. We can see that in front of the mirror, we have a source of light, a little white star, and that light from this source comes up and strikes the mirror, and then it comes and reaches our eye. But our brain doesn't perceive light like that. It assumes that the light must be traveling in a straight line, and then it must be coming from an object over here, behind the mirror. This is called the reflected image of the object. It's what's known as a virtual image, because in reality, there's no such object there. For a flat mirror, the distance between the reflected object and the mirror is exactly the same as the distance between the mirror and the original object. That is, this distance is the same as this distance. Now, if we have a totally flat, smooth mirror, then we have a plane mirror. The reason for this is because it's shaped like a plane. And we know from mathematics that a plane is a long, flat surface that never curves. They can be useful for household mirrors, if we want to look at our reflection. They can be useful in periscopes, if we want to look around a corner or above the water. Barcode scanners, because they can reflect the barcode to the reader. And sextants, a navigation tool like this, which is very helpful for examining the position of stars and the sun in the sky. Although we can still use them to navigate. If the mirror's surface is not smooth, then although it's still reflective, it stops behaving like a plane mirror. And instead of the distance between the object and the reflected image being the same distance from the shiny surface, it's not the same as if we had a plain flat mirror. For that, we'll have to use slightly different techniques to see what, exactly what happens to the reflected light. Now let's talk about something that's not quite a mirror. We'll think about a surface that's not all bumpy and curvy and everything, it can be fairly flat, but it's not flat under a microscope. If we look at it under a microscope or a very powerful magnification device, we'll see that instead of being completely flat, instead has little bumps and ridges in it. So if we draw a diagram, it might look something like this. We can see that the surface of this piece of paper, say, is not completely flat. In this case, the light rays that reflect from the surface aren't all parallel once they reflect because they reflect off the surface in a different way for each part of the light ray. And this means that instead of getting parallel lines, we get lines pointing in all different directions, which can be seen from all different directions, as opposed to only one direction. This is called diffuse reflection. In contrast, if we have parallel lines being reflected into parallel lines, we call it specular reflection. We have diffuse reflection and specular reflection. For almost everything, we can see diffuse reactions, diffuse reflections rather. Although if we could only see in short wavelengths or large wavelengths, the world would look very different. If we have very long wavelength waves, like radio waves, then they tend to do a lot of specular reflection instead of having diffuse reflection. Very short wavelength waves do the opposite thing. All the objects that we can see in the real world have diffuse reflection rather than specular reflection. Take a look at this picture of a keyboard, for example. We can see that right in the middle of the spacebar, there's a bit of specular reflection because we can see that there must be a light illuminating the keyboard. The thing is, we can see the rest of the keyboard illuminated by this light, even though the keys aren't directly reflecting that light. The light is lighting up the entire keyboard due to diffuse reflection. And of course, this is why we can still see the keyboard, even if it's not being directly lit up by the light source. If, for example, we were to look at a mirror in a dark room, we could only see the reflection of something if it was a bright light, uh, but we wouldn't be able to see the rest of the mirror. So you can imagine that if you hold a torch in a dark room and shine it at a mirror, you'll be able to see the reflection of the torch, but no other part of the mirror. But that's an example of specular reflection. Specular reflection isn't very good at illumination. Diffuse reflection, though, as we can see, lets us see objects even if they're not being lit up directly. All right, so that's the end of the theory. We've learned a bit about plane mirrors and reflection. So let's go on to some questions. When a beam of light reflects off a mirror, how does the angle of incidence, which we're going to call I, compare to the angle of reflection, which we're going to call R? We have a few options. The angle of incidence is less than the angle of reflection, is more than the angle of reflection, is equal to the angle of reflection, or we don't have enough information to tell. The question hasn't given us enough information to let us know what the correct answer is. The answer is, of course, that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. This is true for all waves bouncing off plane mirrors. So our answer is C, I equals R. Question two, what is the name given to a perfectly flat, smooth mirror? 
Is it a concave mirror, a convex mirror, a plane mirror, or a reflection mirror? Our answer here is that the mirror has to be shaped like a geometric plane if it's perfectly flat, which means that we can call it a plane mirror. So C is the correct answer. Concave and convex mirrors are different kinds of mirrors that we'll be covering in a little while. Question three, draw the normal to this polygon at the point indicated. We can imagine that there are six different normals that we could draw, although those would be parallel in pairs. Remember that the normal at any surface is going to be perpendicular to that surface. If we're drawing a normal at this point, then the normal will be perpendicular to the hexagon at this point. Therefore, it looks something like this. You've seen that I've drawn the right angle as well. If we were to extend this normal through to the other end of the hexagon, we could see that it would also be normal to this edge. And similarly, the normals drawn at the top or bottom edge of the hexagon would also be parallel, although they would not be parallel to this other normal that we've drawn. Question four, complete the diagram to show how the ray of light reflects. We have an incoming ray, we have a mirror. So how do we figure out how the object reflects, how the light reflects rather? Well, we know that the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection, but how can we see what the angle of incidence is? Well, the best way to do it would be to draw a normal. So let's do that now. Uh, a line that's perpendicular to the surface of the mirror that we're reflecting from. This angle inside, marked in yellow, is the angle of incidence between the incident ray and the normal. The reflected ray will need to have the same angle between the ray and the normal. So it should look something like this. And that's our answer. That's how the ray of reflected light moves away from the mirror. Finally, question five. Explain the difference between a mirror and a piece of paper in terms of light reflection. Now we know that if we hold up a piece of paper, we don't see our own reflection in it. So they have to differ somehow. The difference between them, of course, is the difference between a specular reflection and a diffuse reflection. When light reflects off a mirror, parallel beams of light always reflect in the same direction because the mirror is perfectly flat and smooth. A piece of paper is not microscopically smooth. It's actually a little bit rough. It has these little up and down ridges. What this means is that it does not produce specular reflection. Instead, the light undergoes diffuse reflection. So parallel beams of light bounce off the paper in different directions. It means that if a piece of paper is being illuminated by a source of light, you don't need to be standing directly in the reflection to be able to see the light. The reflection of the light source bounces off in all directions which means that we can see the piece of paper from any direction if it's being lit up. Whereas for a mirror, we cannot see the reflection of a light source from every single location around the mirror. So that's the end of question five, which means we're at the end of the questions. So in this section, we've learned about how light reflects from mirrors, in particular, plane mirrors. We've also learned about the difference between specular reflection and diffuse reflection.